you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks, it's Foss here from thechrisfossshow.com. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. When the Iron Lady sings it, that makes it official. Welcome to the show, as always. We appreciate you guys being part of the Chris Foss Show elite group, where we bring you the CEOs for 15 years, the billionaires, the Pulitzer Prize winners, the authors, the people who bring you the most smartest minds, the White House advisors, the government workers, people who are politicians as well. We, we include the politicians. It's a... It's an act of charity. <laughs> we love them. Anyway, guys, we have the, all, as always, the most amazing guests on the show. And all we ask of you is the very simple begging, pleading, groveling to refer the show to your family, friends, or relatives. Go to goodreads.com, for chess, Chris Voss, LinkedIn.com, for chess, Chris Voss. Subscribe that darn LinkedIn newsletter, eh? That thing grows like a weed. I didn't know there was that many people on, uh, what is it, uh, the LinkedIn platform, but there are. It's amazing to me. And I don't know, they don't seem to be. I don't know. I haven't checked to see who actually subscribes to it, but they seem like intelligent people so far. Go to the 130,000 LinkedIn group. Chris Voss, one of the TikTok, and Ian Chris Voss, Facebook.com to interact with the show. Today we have Micah Lamar. He is the founder and CEO of WallStreet.io, and we're going to be talking about his startup. You, he has apps and stuff that go with it, and uh, kind of how he went through his entrepreneurial journey. So you're going to be learn, able to learn from that as well. Welcome to the show, Micah. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I am doing excellent. Welcome to the show. I think I just gave your .com.io out. Is there any other place on the internet that you want to have people look you up on the interwebs and follow you? Hey, thanks, thanks for asking. Yeah, you can check us out at wallstreet.io, and you can also find us in the App Store, Google Play Store, and the iPhone App Store under wallstreet.io as well. So just the our main website is great. There you go. So give us a 30,000 overview of what wallstreet.io is. Yeah, so we built a tech platform for stock traders, option traders, and our platform and our technology helps them chart, do analysis research, but most importantly, it helps them backtest and validate their ideas in real mm -hmm. time. And we're kind of unique in the niche of like data analysis and research because of the extra backtesting and validation we have inside of our platform. There you go. And let's lay a foundation for definitions. What does backtesting mean exactly in, in, in how you guys are utilizing it? Yeah, so if you think about a, a stock, it's got all this historical data, and backtesting basically allows you to take an idea that you have, uh, mm -hmm. see how it had worked over time to see if it's a strategy that uh, you know is a good strategy or a bad strategy. And so mm -hmm. there's the main goal is to basically debunk strategies that don't really work that well. And to try and find and optimize a strategy that does work well, and then to actually then go ahead and forward test it with real data. Ah, so you can see if if it, do you, is it basically a system where you go, hey, if I would invested, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in this stock five years ago, would it work for me? Sort of thing. Yeah, kind of like that. It's a little bit more for the kind of geeky technical analysts out there who ah. want to use indicators, the averages, and things like that. You know, there's a lot of people who post up trading ideas in stock forums, you know, buy when this moving average crosses over this one or something like that. So in our platform, rather than just kind of guessing or reading somebody else's advice, you can actually go in and a few buttons and no coding, you can go and back test that idea to see, hey, is this guy or gal, you know, got a great strategy or are they just, you know, blowing smoke? There you go. And you guys provide free live charts. So they can use yeah. professional tools, 120 plus indicators. You know, what's funny is I grew up in the age of the eighties where you would buy these massively, I don't know, half inch thick chart things to be mailed to you. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> of course, by the time they were mailed to you, they're, they're out of date. Right. But, uh, and you know, you'd have to go through them by hand and usually the print, you know, you have these black fingers by the time you go through all the print. It was those, those were the days. Back Times then. have changed, man. Times have changed, changed baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so 
recently, you know, what we're most proud about is, you know, we've always been a really premium product, you know, people have to pay to kind of use our service. Uh, just a couple of months ago, we released a brand new free tool for the world. Like you had mentioned, you know, you can now come on and get a professional charting application, uh, desktop, Android, iPhone for free. Mm -hmm. And we went ahead and made our back testing free because we really want to make sure everybody has, you know, the tools to actually validate their ideas. And so we made that free as well. There you go. What are some of the other features that are on the desktop or mobile? Yeah, it's a little bit more geeky stuff that I kind of like to do. But, you know, we realized that a lot of really smart people are using our platform, you know, former floor traders, former big bank executives, market makers, things like that. And so they've been testing some really cool strategies. Mm -hmm. And so what we actually did is we created this crowdsource function where when people backtest an idea, it gets pushed to our server through a weighting system that we've developed to kind of find a good strategies to rate them. And then we crowdsource them. So we make the best strategies available to everybody in the group. There you go. And, you know, strategy is everything as to uh, what you do. And then speed, of course, is a thing. How do you make sure that uh, you, you give fast loading times and fast uh, data to people? Yeah, so we have a really cool relationship with several exchanges uh, mm -hmm. that basically provide real-time data. And, you know, without going into the technology too much, you know, we basically have an open system where the data flows freely from the exchange right into our charts, providing real-time data. And our backtesting, you know, usually under a second, you can backtest something. There you go. And then you guys cover what you call seasonality. Tell us what that means. Yeah, seasonality is this idea that oftentimes stocks will have a seasonal trend. You know, for example, Apple, which is one of the stocks that I cover most, you know, they always have their iPhone events at the same time of the year. They always have a big Christmas mm. you know, rush. It's very seasonal, and so oftentimes we see seasonal moves that are very consistent every single year. And mm. so we think that it's important to track that. So we created a seasonality tool that basically shows you, you know, the average moves that stocks have you know, each month, and you can actually break it down by week two if you want to kind of dig in a little bit more. There are, you know, there's a lot, there's businesses that are cyclical. Do you, is there any way to track that as well? Yeah, so we oftentimes will post up a seasonal watch list of stocks that are really hot, you know, as mm -hmm. they come into their seasonal, seasonal months. There you go. There's another thing you guys track in your website called a scan tool that can scan st trading strategies through millions of them. Yeah, so we've, we've back tested a lot of stuff. I mean, you know, we, we started in 2011 and we've tested over 65 million strategies mm. with our community. So it's, you know, we pushed through a lot of data. And mm. so as I, I had shared earlier, you know, oftentimes the best strategies are the ones created by, you know, some of our really smart community members. They're pay, actually paying to be there. And so we created a scan tool that allows people to search through the database of strategies it's kind of a, an element of our crowdsource function. So those oh. are strategies actually discovered by other members of the community that mm -hmm. everybody who's paying client can actually scan through. It's pretty cool. Oh wow! There, yeah. there you go. You have access to all the all the brain work, and the computer is doing it for you. That's, Do you guys? I see was going to say so. Um, you know, we we found that you know five to ten percent of our community members love to geek out and back test, and everybody else just wants to. They just want to see the best strategies. And so we've kind of given a little bit of both for, for both types of people. There you go. How do you guys try and separate yourselves apart from your competitors? Well, there's not a lot of other companies right now that are doing backtesting, crowdsourcing at the level that, mm. that we are. So we're kind of we're kind of a one and done. Mm. So we don't really have a lot of competition in that world. That's uh, pretty nice. the, the only competition we probably have are you know, private firms, big banks, they throw tens of millions of dollars at supercomputers and quants and things like that to kind of accomplish the same goal. Mm -hmm. our, our vision was really to kind of democratize that so that anybody who's got a laptop or you know a phone or a computer can get access to the same kind of data crunching that those big banks are using. There you go. So give us a little bit of history of your entrepreneurial journey. How did you come down this line and get involved in the business? How did you first become an entrepreneur? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. So I studied securities analysis, made uh, managerial finance, a bunch of you know accounting stuff in, in college here in Santa Barbara where I live, mm -hmm. and always interested in entrepreneurship. You know, my my parents were both entrepreneurs, and I was reading this Inc. magazine, you know, Inc., you know, Handbook for Business Entrepreneurs in mm -hmm. my 20s, and there's this episode called "The 30 Under 30," right? 30 30 kids who had made a big wave in business, all under 30 years old. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wow, these are my people, you know? And so I read through every single case study of all 30. And mm-hmm. I'm in my mid-20s, and I'm noticing that there's a trend there. Right? So three things that I took away from all 30 of those case studies were, you know, it was uh, the best businesses were community-based, so they had some kind of community element. Oh. They were digital or digital, uh, digitally delivered so that they could scale, right? It wasn't mm-hmm. something like, uh, you know, you had to make a widget for your phone. They had to, you know, produce and keep producing over and over again. Mm-hmm. And then they had some kind of subscription base so that as a business owner, you can have somebody sign up and if they like the product, they pay a little bit every month. And then that gives the company lots of good resources monetarily to continue to reinvest and grow the business and the product and make it better over time. And so with those three things, and with the background in finance and securities and some of the Apple trading I was already doing, I was like, wow, I should create like an Apple forum or an Apple-based product um, mm-hmm. and share my Apple ideas with the world. And so our company actually started out as a just blog called Apple Trader in 2011. Mm-hmm. And we were a blog called Apple Trader. For about four years, we created a little membership site where we post our content and ideas. And then we started kind of digging into software. We rebranded as Wall Street in 2015, and that's where we went heavy into back testing and wow. the, soft, the software end of things. So it's been a journey. There you go. And so, how long has the company been running officially now? Since 2011. So, there you go. Yeah. Congratulations, man. Thanks. Yeah. Kicking ass, taking names, and, and delivering it. And of course, the stock market, I think, didn't just reach a new peak. The, the Dow did. Things yeah. seem to be going well over there. <laughs> so, it moves in cycles, but yes, we've just hit new all-time highs, and a lot of tech stocks are, you know, are climbing. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, it's been an interesting. It's been an interesting market in the way everything's gone with you know post COVID sort of thing. What do you foresee with the future of your company? You've got the apps. Is AI coming into play into what you do yet? Do you see that? being maybe something that has some promising technology for you and your company and your consumers? Yeah, I think that there's some potentially used like machine learning or AI in how we analyze our strategies and the research that we provide for that. Uh, Mm -hmm. Right now, we we find that there's this like tremendous element in the human capacity and the human brain for identifying strategies. And so Mm -hmm. we're still, we still think there's a lot of potential there inside the breadth of our community. And so by having that human interaction, I think that that really helps rather than like an isolated AI. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's kind of our, our view on that, at least, at least for now. Yeah. If, if, you know, there's this, this AI has the process to, you know, suck up so much data and then process it ultra fast, speedy Gonzalez type thing. I'm not sure that's the technical term. (laughs) Kind of, yeah. I mean, there's certainly a lot of processing. You know, we've seen, because we've we've tested a lot of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we we did at one point build a super processor that just spun through strategies to test them. But what Mm -hmm. we found was, you know, it tended to kind of do this thing called curve fitting a little too much, which is basically finding the ideal scenario for the past. And then Mm -hmm. You're always going to find something that's amazing out of that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to forward test or trade well in the future. So yeah. we found that by the super processor route, we tended to get overfitted strategies versus the human element, the human touch. We we're able to kind of go in there and use some of the ideas and technical ideas that people have been trading with for a long time. You're able to get strategies that can kind of withstand the test of time a little bit better. So so mm-hmm. far, that's what. Our research is found. There you go. You don't want to. You don't want to. You don't want to picking up like U.S. Steel and going, "Hey, this worked really good for a while," and then you're like, "Yeah, that's that, that's uh, that was over a while ago." <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's hard to you know. Uh, Elon Musk and Jack Ma got into this big thing about you know he, the Alibaba CEO said you know computers are never going to be smarter than humans, and Elon disagreed. That's a big thing. Where do you like on that? I I think I think computers and AI are going to be smarter than humans by far. Yeah. Part of it part of it is you know we've talked about this a couple times on the show recently. We just posted a new AI show that had a great discussion that that uh, talked about AI. But you know, humans are limited by our paradigms and our and our mindset. Mm. So our paradigms are to breed. The universe uses us to breed right. our job is to propagate the species everything we do every you know you can you can think you're above the animal nature of your of your state but we're animals and, and our paradigms are to breed we're one of the few animals not the only animals that are conscious and aware like yeah. we can sit around and contemplate our navel in the universe but other than that 
we, you know, we bike. Everything a man does is to is to meet women, propagate the species, marry, have children, you know, raise those children, you know, diversify the DNA pool. Everything is to try and make the species continue. AI doesn't have that paradigm or limits of our biology. It's not really concerned about impressing chicks. It's not really concerned about having children. And so what it's going to be thinking about, you know, I was listening to Sam Harris and Mark Andreessen's debate on this on Sam Harris's podcast. And, you know, and Mark Adris is like, yeah, it's AI sucked up all of the best of us, so it'll be great. And it's like, no, it won't. It sucked up the worst of us, too. Like, it sucked up, you know, Hitler and Mein Kampf and, you know, maybe maybe all the great books that we've ever written in art. But, you know, it also sucked up, you know, the horrors of, of the human race. But I think what it's going to do is it's going to take and move beyond that where it's going to think about things that maybe we, we, we can't even imagine or haven't imagined. And I I think that he may be right on one scale where the, our ability to create and innovate and make up stuff, our ability for art and, or to, you know, think of new paradigms or ways of doing, I think that will be the thing that maybe it won't extinct us because we're kind of a bother and we're kind of sub, you know, but it, it will be its own species. It, we've created a species. And we need to recognize that species is probably going to look at us and go, do I need you anymore? Because up until then, up until now, you know, we've, we've been able to destroy ourselves. You know, we reached that pinnacle of a, of a species that's, hey, let's figure out how we can blow ourselves off the fucking planet with the push of a button. Right. We had control of the button, right? Well, now we've created a species that can go create its own button, and we have no control over when it wants to push it. Or how it wants to push it. It can do whatever the fuck it wants. There, therein lies kind of where we're at. We've outspecied ourselves when you really study species history. We just, uh, we just posted a recent episode by David R. Wood called The Origin of Artificial Species. And he's actually taken Darwinism and several other different things that have been studied throughout history and, and species and overlaid it with what, what we've created with an artificial AI. And we've created new species. And, uh, you know, we're going to, we may have to be competing with it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's remarkable and scary all in the same moment. Yeah. I mean, we had a good run. I mean, it was, it was pretty <laughs> good. Social media pretty much went to it. But, you know, I, it'll be interesting to see. Hopefully, uh, hopefully it works out. We all get along with our new species. And hopefully, you know, I mean, you're talking about something easily fine to have its own rights, to have its own independence, to have its own freedoms with the SCOTUS. I mean, you could... It can hire an attorney if it wants to. And, and uh, you know, corporations are already people, really, yeah. like, down to the law in America. AI system could actually, the way the Constitution is written, is declare itself its own, maybe, race, species, and uh, declare its own freedoms. And then maybe eventually declare itself its own government. <laughs> you know, there's already, you know, CEOs or companies that are, you know, outsourcing the CEO role to AI. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. They're, they're baby steps into that world right now. I think it's interesting you know, when I think about the, the world of AI and the world of humans and you know, mm-hmm. where the overlap is and everything. There's a certain element that, uh, that I love about the human nature, you know, the, the moment of intuition, the moment of insight, things that mm-hmm. I'm not sure robots can quantify or, or exist yet inside of the realm of, you know, in, of intuition or human empathy or the human condition. Uh, mm-hmm. And to truly feel what it's like to, like you said, to have a conscious thought and to be alive and, and things that makes it so fun to be human, right? Yeah. And then there's, there's the other world of, well, when you, when you abstract out of that for a moment, you know, there's mm-hmm. so much potential and perhaps what gives us our you know, blessed life here and that really cool thing about being human is also potentially something that may limit us. It did, and uh, and I think it does. It limits our thinking. Yeah. I mean, we spend if 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 your guy spends half the time, you know, going how, how do I find a woman? How do I marry and propagate the species? You know, you're, you're fairly limited in your mindset. This is a thing that can sit around. It's not watching the Kardashians drooling out the side of its mouth, you know, or or idiot TV all day long. Yeah. It's going to be sitting at 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 hyper speeds. Thinking about, I don't know, quantum physics, cold fusion, nuclear, whatever, new power sources. I mean, it's going to be doing its own thing at a speed and rate and 
may, maybe at a greater imagination than we've ever had a scope for. And well, we're all just sitting around, I don't know, looking at Netflix, losing IQ things on TikTok. You know, yeah. it's going to be, it's going to be thinking about, you know, and it's, and it could be sitting around going, Hey, you know, how do we use these people for fuel? What's that movie? Green, green, whatever is Charlton Heston. You know, it's going to be coming yeah. up with all sorts of shit. The battery element of the human. <laughs> yeah. How do we turn this into a battery? Oh, we, we just invented the matrix. Oh, <laughs> You know, yeah. who knows? But we, it, I think, I think uh, the gentleman we had on who identified that it is a created species, and he basically used historical analysis and Darwin's mm -hmm. species and and some of those other applications to to realize this. And now he's trying to get on government boards. He's speaking Silicon Valley people to to try and rein in how we look at this because once you understand it as a species. It kind of takes on a whole different role. So there you go. You treat, treat it definitely, treat it differently for sure. Definitely. And so when he trades for your company, you know, he's going to be ultra Ivan Bielski or something. I don't know. It's a joke, <laughs> joke there somewhere. To, to greet, he's going to be greed is good, but he's going to go a whole new ex, extra level or something. I don't know. There you yeah, go. technology's moving pretty fast. You know, how far do you think? You know, obviously some of the big companies, you know, military, everything. You know, they're producing technologies that are far and beyond what we see. You know, how far is the gap right now? Do you think where AI actually exists and where the general population believes it exists? You know, that's 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 still beyond my pay grade. I don't yeah. study it as much as some of my other friends in Silicon Valley, and and uh, I. have I have no idea. I mean, I'm still just trying to catch up to it all. I'm, I'm usually, I've always been kind of an innovator and kept my finger on the pulse. I was early to social media and understood what, what it was. Social media. It's right. social marketing. Yeah. Real, like, I would see people try and define it. They're like, I have a whole course on what social media is. And I'm like, How the, why do you need a fucking course? It's social just media. Hours. <laughs> social media. Right. It's real simple. And, uh, you know, but, you know, that's kind of turned into its own form of Pandora's box. And that was one of the things we talked about in the other show is, is, you know, every time we create this sort of new utopia where everyone's sitting around kumbaya going, this is going to bring the world close together. We're all going to be huggy and playing John Lennon's song, Imagine, which I love, you know, then all of a sudden now the Pandora's box jumps. The and you're like, holy shit, it's a mirror. It's us at our worst, and you know, thereby, and, thereby we go. The one thing man can learn from his history, I always say, is that he never learns from his history, and thereby we go round and round. So it'll be interesting, but we had a good run. The yeah, social media is interesting, you know. I think people have different philosophies on that. Yeah. You know, it certainly has a huge diction element to it, and I think that becomes an issue with self confidence, especially as people are coming up in their. In oh yeah. Teenage years, and you know, they say your human brain's not even fully developed until you're 25, and it's very open to influences and things. And I can just imagine, you know, as a teenager nowadays, with the influences of that, really distorting what the true reality is of, of our life and what's possible when they see, you know, all the influencers, celebrities doing these things that they think is normal. It's 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 actually more harm than good. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is. I mean, I, I wondered about it when I started seeing, you know, in the early 2010s, people were starting to put their kids online. And, you know, here, here's my naked baby. And I'm just like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? That kid, when he's 18, is going to, his, his, his people who hire him are going to do background searches and find, oh, here's what, here's what naked Bobby looked like when he was one. You know, they're picking dot coms for people. Recently, I was commenting on this where there's this gal named, I think it's her name's called Ruby, and she was one of these psycho YouTube stars' parents who exploited her children and then, you know, abused them. And like everybody for years on YouTube yeah. was like, hey, you're abusing your kids, eh, man? There's something going on there to the point they were calling CP or C protection oh, okay. services wow. on CPS. And then finally, you know, the kids show up in duct tape at a neighbor's house bound with wounds. And, you know, I, I, I can't remember. It's something, her name's Ruby something. People can Google it. But, you know, I, I'm starting to wonder if maybe there's going to be lawsuits of all these kids who are like, man, my parents exploited me on YouTube and on the internet when I was young. And I had no uh, real say in it. I had no say in it. And now, you know, every employer picks it up and... You know, I, I basically 
was exploiting. <laughs> I'm starting to wonder if that's the future because I would be kind of pissed at my parents. I'm like, what did you share about me? You know, that's, that's uh, whatever. And I think the other future thing is, and I know it, it, it sounds a little bit crass, but it's not this whole generation of, of people who've been sharing their body parts on Snapchat. And I think what's you're going to have, have happen is there's these huge libraries that people have had in their phones, their Google photos, their Apple, you know, what's that thing Apple has in the air? Like, the Apple, like yeah, the cloud, like iCloud, Apple, uh, like Google photos. And you're going to have, you know, people who are going to be running for high powered jobs that most people do in their forties. So president, speaker of the, of the house, you know, yeah, politicians. 20 some, years later. Yeah. 20 years later. And somebody's going to be going. Hey, I have a dick pic of them. When they were 20, they sent me on Snapchat. Check this out. Yeah. And we're already seeing that. There was recently a, a congresswoman who was, I think, running for Congress. She she was, you know, her and her husband were doing swinger stuff. And and then she did some live stuff on, I don't know, some website where you do live amateur porn. And it came out. And then the ironic thing is she's angry about it. Like, how dare you? It's like. You, you, put in life, yeah. <laughs> you put it on our life, yeah. You put it on our life, and and there's there's a couple other people now that are that are that's coming out. You know, moms of, I think it's moms of something that uh, you know she's she's out there banging you know the the pulpit for the right wing and Ron DeSantis for for uh, you know they're anti-gay LGBT, and here it recently came out that they had a swinger lesbian affair, and you're like, wait. You're again okay. This, you know, it's just, I think that's going to be the new frontier of being weird. And I think there's going to be somebody who's going to run for president, and there's going to be a dick pic come out of left field. <laughs> you know, it's going to be know, weird. It's it's a balance of you know we're becoming more and more immune to these things as yeah. they just come out every day. But at the same time, I think it's important as parents. I'm not sure if you have kids. I have three kids. As yeah. parents, to teach our kids to be leaders and not followers. Exactly. Uh, make sure our kids have self confidence. Make sure they can be independent thinkers. Make sure that they can, in those moments of peer pressure, in those moments where they can go down that route, where they're able to have the tools to stop and reflect and, and choose and decide whether that's something that is going to be the best choice for them or not. Do you find that you're more sensitive to raising kids that are self-accountable and with that sort of mindset because you're an entrepreneur? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly a balance because my wife and I, Christine, you know, she's very into kids having complete autonomy and having lots of validation. And I, I kind of want to jump in and help in the solution. And so it's a constant balance of, you know, you really want them to go through and experience the things that they, that they are because they need to learn and mm -hmm. also validating them at the same time and how they're feeling so that they can grow their self-confidence. But as an entrepreneur, I tend to, you know, be a very optimist, you know, I was optimist at heart. And so, Mm -hmm. Being that way, I'm more solution oriented. You know, it, it's certainly a balance for kids. Always, I, I think the most important thing is growing their self confidence and making mm -hmm. sure they they learn how to be a leader and how they think and not somebody who's just following along. I, you know, the one thing about being an entrepreneur is you really are more self actualized. I think than most people, you're more self aware, you're more self accountable. Because, you know, the buck stops here. You don't have anybody you can be like, hey, let's blame the guy who's the boss above me. Oh, wait, it's me. 1,000%. Yeah. yeah. And so I think and it sounds like you think about terms in terms of leadership, how you lead. I mean, clearly you guys have built a successful company for quite some time. So I, 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 I have to assume you've done that because, because you probably wouldn't be here if you didn't. And. And so I always felt that, you know, my, my employees would always joke with me that when Chris has kids, he's going to, he's going to sit with them and read the wall street journal to him and be like, IBM did blah, blah, blah today. And they're all going to like tuck into bed with little double breasted suit pajamas and shit. And then if he, they don't have their own companies by eight, he's probably going to put them up for adoption, which is true. Cause I would have, but I didn't, and I didn't ever have kids. I couldn't afford the divorce. I'm still saving up for my first divorse of about 5 million I've saved so far. If I lose half of that, I still have two and a half. I need some more money. Um, there's still time though. I'm, you know, I meet, I meet women. They want, I want to be your first divorcee. And I'm like, yeah, I'll think about it. But you know, I think more people need to be intentionalists when they raise children in today's environment. Like you say, they need yeah, a little well, social media. Yeah. yeah, I think I think as parents, you know, they oftentimes say you're going to learn on the job, right? You learn it. There's, there's some elements that are true there, but it doesn't mean that you can't actively go out and try and be a better parent. 
doesn't mean you can't actively go out and read a book. Too. You mean so, people should try to be better parents? Come on. They just. 1,000%. Yeah, 1,000%. Just like the relationship, you got to work for it. Just like the work, you know. Yeah. If I'm, as the CEO, if there's something that I need to learn how to do better at, I'm going to go out there and actively study and learn how to do it. If I want to be a great parent, I need to be yeah. active in that role as well. Being a great parent, where is the fun in that? I mean, I thought half your job as a parent is to give give them all the scars and emotional damage they need to spend the rest of their life in a therapist's office. I, mean, I thought that was a whole job of a parent. Hard work up front, easy on the tail end. <laughs> you know, I, I see our kids because we do something called like restaurant matters at home where we're eating dinner and we have certain things that we do while we're eating that then we can take to restaurants so that we don't have cavemen at the table. Oh. At the there you go. Right. And I see other parents, and you know, I don't know how you feel about this, like the iPad while the kid is eating. Oh, god! You know, instead of having a conversation with the kids, or, yeah. them, or having them be able to actually sit through a restaurant without losing their mind, you know, mm -hmm. it's all those things that you do that are hard up front, but you there know, you go. great on the channel. So duct tape, basically. No, I'm yeah, just duct tape. Yeah, duct tape, and then the screen just right to their face. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna be there soon, though. I mean, the Apple. Uh, Vision Pro is coming out supposedly in <laughs> in a in another month or so, and you know I, I'm not a big fan of wearing electronics on my body. I bought I, the Apple Watch. I didn't like it because I just don't like electronics on me. But I'm a yeah. huge fan of Apple, and I, I yeah. think that this is actually going to open up another hundred billion dollar ecosystem yeah. uh, industry, just like the App Store did. And there are businesses that will be created over the next 10 to 15 years in AR, augmented reality, on the, totally. on the Apple uh, ecosystem that they're creating that we can't even think of yet. You know what I mean? Just like the App Store, like 17 years ago when the iPhone launched, you know, we would never have imagined all the multi-billion dollar apps that have, have been created in the last, you know, 15 to 17 years. And I think, I think we're entering that new phase right now where, you know, it's going to be huge. This is why I kind of focus a lot of my energy on Apple, Apple analysis and the growth of mm -hmm. the ecosystem at Wall Street AO. And I think that while it is kind of weird to you know, have a device right in your face, I do think it's going to open up a $100 billion industry. And I'm really excited to see all the stuff that comes out of it, actually. There you go. I sweat like a pig, and so any I, you know, I think I think you're right. I think it's a very cool technology. Maybe the young kids will enjoy it more. Having a heavy thing sitting on my face that I'm just going to sweat and yeah. fog up, but you know, it's it's and and I, my friends, I but I have my friends my age, like my friend Robert Scoble. He loves the crap out of. He's actually lost weight, you know, doing the exercises and like dancing the, and the Wii and the. Also, yeah. all the all the stuff you can do on them, you know, playing games where you're, you know, your mm -hmm. your full body's in motion. He's actually lost weight doing it. I'm kind of jealous, but you know, some it, it's going to be some something that people really love. But I think, you know, like in your case, there's probably a lot of use applications where you know, me instead of looking at your app or website, I can sit there and maybe swipe through the visuals of of graphic data that's on your website. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be very cool what it, what it allows us to do. And I, I think the whole world of VR and AR, I think AR yeah. is going to be the absolute winner there. I don't think people are really going to want to spend a lot of time, this is my prediction, my opinion, in a world where it's closed off and they're just in that world. I think that's going to be very isolated to specific types of games. Yeah. Whereas the AR is the glass, you can still see everything around you, and, you know, it's just presented on like a heads up display. And I would imagine that as technology improves, the device will get lighter, smaller, ultimately become like a pair of glasses or maybe the mm. contact lens like you had in black mirror. <laughs> I still miss Google Glass. That thing was so nice. It never but, took off. Yeah. Here's the thing that I think people, I'm worried about, like if somebody walks up to me and, you know, they have a phone out like this and they're recording me, like as they talk to me, it's mm -hmm. the same feeling when someone has a, a camera on their glasses. I'm like, oh, are yeah. you like recording me right now? What are you doing? And so I think that's a hard bridge to cross. Oh, me and my friends got so much shit back in the day. I actually had what people. Well, we had the Google Glass, and right. uh, and there was several times. And this is kind of before. This is before. Mark, you know, pretty much woke everybody up. Mark Zuckerberg woke everybody up and says, there isn't any privacy left. Privacy is dead. Remember that? And everyone got so angry. And then like a year or two, everyone was like, yeah, I guess he's right. We've sold our souls to the devil. Um, but back then, we, we hadn't crossed that bridge yet. 
And I remember, I think the, the worst, there were friends of mine that, you know, they're getting right up, they were getting thrown out of bars and, you know, places were putting up signs that were like, you know, Ooh, glass, not welcome here. And I remember being in LA, I was at a magician show with some friends and this guy came up to me and he was really angry and he goes, that thing's recording all the time. And I, I, I showed it to him and I go, I, it's actually off right now because the battery's dead because I recorded about 10 minutes of the show. And I'm like, it only records about, you know, it's a small battery. It only records like 10 minutes. And he goes, no, no, it has a way of staying on. You know, that sort of <laughs> conspiracy nut job. And I said to him, I says, look around this room right now. This room is filled with cameras. See all these security cameras? The, y you live in a camera world, you know. It's just theaters or what they want to get yeah but he was he was really angry to a point of almost violence and i'm a six foot two guy and very big yeah, and then yeah. i have resting bitch face so you don't really intimidate me but he was kind of a, a fat guy and and you know i had to calm down a little bit <laughs> you're shit in line but i took him off just to kind of you know because i don't I don't need to be causing any problems. I don't right. like, I'm not into felonies. It's kind of a thing. I'm mean, going to jail for beating the shit out of people. Um, but you know, it, he, he was, he was really upset about it. And, and I was like, okay, well, you know, it's, it, the battery was dead anyway. So I'm like, I'll just take him off. Just yeah. to PG, well, but, people are going to get offended at anything. I think we're seeing the, the, the yeah. Uh, the, <laughs> you bring up an interesting point though because like i remember in 2012 2011 when devices really took off i was an early yeah. adopter of the ipad and stuff but when devices really became a commodity uh, i think around 2012 i started going into restaurants like we were talking about earlier and i would see whole families you know sitting there with the you know zombie yeah. mode and yeah. i'm like holy shit there's two kids there's a husband and wife and each of them have their own devices and they're sitting there drilling out the side of their face looking at their things while eating and so, uh, i'm like i don't think this is good <laughs> and no one's conversing and you know my family you know we all to sit down and talk to each other our parents made us do that it was it was hell, but that, well, look out! You got this awesome podcast. And you're excellent yeah. at talking to people. So where did those skills come yeah, from? Yeah, maybe maybe that's where it all came from. I can I can thank my parents for, it. but you know now the imagination image you've given me is that people are going to wear those Apple headsets and they're just going to be sitting at dinner for all four or five of them going. Yeah, going like this, like tapping. tapping. <laughs> you're going to be looking at Not your. Uh, the you're gonna look at your shitty fast food, and the AR is gonna be showing you your fine dining or something. Like <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the future that you guys? Anything you want to tease out about your guys' future that you guys are innovating, working on that maybe you're gonna be putting out here? What twenty four or twenty twenty four holds for you or the stock market? Yeah, so we spent a lot of time this year really tripling down on our technology. You know, we mm -hmm. grew our engineering team pretty substantially over the last year to build some new products. And this next year, what we really find is that, uh, you know, people, the majority of people want something that is easier to digest. And so we're actually taking a lot of our best strategies that we found in our platform and publishing them as newsletters. Mm -hmm. So that for people who are busy, working, family, totally get it. I'm in that same camp. You can get the best of what we do in an email newsletter. And so we're starting in January with an Apple newsletter. That's going to be mm -hmm. highlighting one of my favorite Apple strategies. It gets you in and out of the stock about 12 times a year. Mm -hmm. It averages about 36 to 48% of the year over the last five years, which is great for the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. And it only ties up your capital 35% of the year. So if you have you know, a high interest savings account or something like that, you just you earn interest while you're not you know, in the stock. It catches most of the big upswings in Apple, avoids the big downswings, which are you know, emotionally challenging for a lot of people. And you know, what we're really looking forward to next year is taking our strategies, putting them together in some really cool newsletters and you know, getting them into people's inboxes, which is going to be a, a great way for them to be able to absorb that content, make some new actual investments from it. There you go. Maybe you could go retro and do those mail outs that we used to do when I was studying to be a stockbroker when I was 20 and stuff. The, the big Just stick. A big pamphlet of, of research big data. Th thick book of of charts i remember my fingers were turned black i wish i would have kept one because 
just just in all my records. Right. Just song just dropped <laughs> <seconds>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you you could roll them up and burn them as a log if you ever. I don't know if we ever turned into a nuclear winter. You're like, we can live on these things, but uh, they're really interesting. The stock market. Tell me what you think about it. I mean, it looks like we've. We've peaked on what the Fed has tried to do to rein in inflation. There's predictions from everybody up to, I believe, Jamie, what's his face? It's uh, yeah, yeah. Jamie Diamond that we're going to have. I, I believe there's three rate lowerings on the books. We're in this kind of a new weird era where the baby boomers and, and some of the Gen Xers retired early. So we we don't have as many workers. We're actually you know struggling to fight over workers. And so there's just kind of this new era of productivity where you know we're there i think one of the i think one of the biggest weights in the market might be i was reading yesterday on linkedin that the office glut of of empty office space and failure is going to double uh, go to maybe 20 percent, and that's kind of more of a bank problem than is our problem i i think somehow they're gonna have to try and convert that into residential units is the only way to save that but other than that I, that's the only that's the only problem I see coming forward on the economy. And other than that, I think it's just productivity mainstream. The feds kind of adopted to, you know, this tighter workforce and how we don't have to do a bunch of layoffs to cool the economy. And so I think, I think interest rates are going to go down and kind of get back into a thing. I think inflation might finally calm down maybe a little bit. I could be wrong. And I think that might lead to a really good year for the stock market. Maybe next year. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think we're we're kind of headed to what I like to call a super cycle. Huh? This is where we, we get a few years of good solid growth, especially mm-hmm. on the back of a, a down year, which we had you know last year a year or so ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, I agree. We only have a couple big challenges ahead of us from an economic standpoint. You know, commercial Armageddon is is one of the biggest ones. You know, State Street in Santa Barbara. When I moved here, you know, almost twenty years ago, was the bougiest place. All this great shopping, and now a third of the places are empty. Yeah. And so, you know, what are we going to do with those extra places? You know, residential makes the most sense to convert them somehow to, to do that. I, I think that as as we have these obstacles, you know, it's just more opportunity to try and create a, create a solution for them. The economy, I would never bet it against the U.S. economy. We're just so strong. We're innovative. Yeah. We're always going to pull through. And the U.S. stock market is, market is a good reflection of, of that type of innovation. I'd be focused more on technology. The NASDAQ, the Qs, the QQQs has outperformed the S&P 500 almost always. You know, I like to have an emphasis in technology stocks for that reason. And, you know, I, again, I, I wouldn't bet against the U.S. economy. I think uh, we'll have our ups and downs. It almost feels like we've already kind of gone through a recession. And I know the definition of recession has kind of been altered yeah. recently. But I think that we, things have already been tough. I mean, if you look at, you know, the, the pandemic that we had, Everything mm-hmm. after that, we went through this quick boom, and then all of a sudden, you know, a bunch of people got laid off. You know, it, it's sad to see that people got laid off, and at the same time, it's what companies sometimes need to do to kind of flush out the flarf. Yeah, but there was so much themselves. demand for those employees. I mean, a lot of them just got scooped right back up. You know, I've never seen yeah. a time like this where. You know, everywhere I go, you know, is like hiring employees. You know, the joke was before the pandemic, we were all sitting around arguing politically. Oh, my God, if you take things to $15 an hour, the economy will crash and go bankrupt and companies will fail and we can't do this. And now I think you have, I think I was reading the other day, like 23 or 25 states will be amending their 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 laws for minimum wage and it's $15 plus. 13 15 dollars plus you know it's the the competition like there's there's restaurants around here in my area there was one that was offering uh patrons on a, on a door sign they're like we'll give you a hundred dollar gift certificate for free food here if you refer somebody to work here like the fight it's a battle yeah. it's just a fight for employees and like, i think in the service world that's just going to keep being yeah. you know, the, the thing for sure yeah. Uh, yeah it has been an interesting thing in technology you know we've seen a lot of people who are i don't know if you've heard this whole thing about like holding multiple jobs secretly did you hear mm-hmm. about that yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people do that during covid and remote work yeah right? they're like i'm gonna host i'm gonna have three jobs full-time jobs i'm gonna do all of them kind of crappy but I'm going to get three salaries out of it. That's that's yeah. a challenging place because I get it. But as a business owner, that's 
you know, I have my own opinions about that kind of stuff. There you go. Well, remote workers just, they have so much power now because they can quit. You know, we we talk about that a lot on the show about leadership yeah. where, you know, it's always been where people will quit a job if there's shitty leadership. And so nowadays, even more, you've got to have great leadership well working with remote work because it's it's hard to i think there's a little bit more challenges to being a great leader when people aren't in the room with you or you know there's hybrid but you know there's, there's also different challenges uh, to me it's 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 harder to inspire people over zoom than it is to do in person but um, you know those are some of the challenges that people are going to have you know remote workers working multiple jobs we see their you know the resurgence of unions and the power of employees and stuff so it's going to be it's going to be an interesting world but i think productivity wise it's going to go through the roof and online power with companies like yours and other things you know that's that's just going to feed into it you know i i saw the recent if you saw the recent black friday no one showed up for black friday in stores it's all digital now. yeah yeah, yeah. It, was, it was amazing i'm like at first when i saw the videos people were like yeah it's 8 a.m here in walmart and there's nobody, there's nobody murdering each other, or trying to stomp over each other. We still have a whole stack of TVs, and I'm like, wow, we finally crossed the, we finally Cross crossed that, that threshold. That turning point. It's yeah. Amazing. It's yeah I think more. digital, digital technology, productivity, you know, will only increase as the tools that we use to, to, to have, you know, improve over time. So I there agree. you go. Thank God the Chris Voss show is online. We don't send out a mailer on. <laughs> Every sure. every day you send out a different little little dump drive for so the download. We'll send out we'll send out the little thick things that we used to do with the stock market. Well, Micah, tell people how they can onboard with you, check out your product and all that good stuff. Do they need a minimum qualification or minimum investment or anything like that? Yeah, so I'm glad you asked that question, Chris. So Wall Street AO, our base membership is free. So all you need is an email. You can go to Wall Street.io you know, sign up with an email, confirm your email, and then you get access to our professional charity tools with real-time data, zero dollars a month. Yeah. Uh, that's a really great place to start. And so we built that so that, you know, people who are just wanting to get started, you know, instead of paying a really big membership fee for charts or data or anything like that, you know, get started for free at Wall Street AO. There you go. Do it now or else. Yeah. I don't know what that means. There you go. Wall Street dot io thank you very much for coming on the show we really appreciate it man this has been a great discussion absolutely i appreciate you having me here there you go and uh, thanks for audience for tuning in go to goodreads.com for chess chris foss linkedin.com for chess chris foss chris foss one of the tiktok and you subscribe to the big linkedin newsletter and the hundred thirty thousand group over on linkedin as well thanks for tuning in be good to each other stay safe we'll see you guys next time